my name is Carrie Roberts. I, as was introduced, work for the Center for Innovating Research and Learning, which is housed at the Mag Lab. And we kind of take the lead on all of our um, core grants, broader impacts through the NSF. Um, so that's kind of the context of in which we operate. So we run programs uh, K-12, college, graduate students, postdocs, and we do professional development for teachers, um, K-12 teachers. And so we have um, four staff members. We have our director of the center. We have someone who runs our adult program, so undergrad and above, and teachers. And then we have a K-12 um, outreach director. And then I serve as the program evaluator. So I kind of operate in that analyst uh, program evaluation role for all of the programs. Um, so that's where we have um, potential partnership avenues would be through if you wanted to host an REU student over the summer um, as an undergrad that would do research in your lab. We have partnerships there if you wanted to host teachers um, or help collaborate on some summer camp activities. Those are pathways we've had um, career grant participation in the past. So just some ideas, food for thought. So the um, Office of STEM Teaching Activities was developed by the College of Arts and Sciences in 1983 uh, in response to a, a seminal paper in science education called The Nation at Risk. And we've been operating since that time. Uh, currently we have six faculty members in the office who um, support K-12 uh, outreach for the College of Arts and Sciences as well, um, and we have uh, a number of different programs. There are six different programs that run regularly all year round for students. We can talk about some of those programs if you want. Um, those programs always invite faculty who want to participate as part of their broader impact, um, have different uh, ideas for things that could be done in K-12 classrooms. We connect a lot of people with teachers in K-12 classrooms. We help you find teachers who might want to come in and do a research experience for teachers in the summer on your grants. Um, as well, we run a high school uh, residential summer program here at FSU that brings um, high potential uh, math and science students to Florida State for six weeks. We put them in your labs uh, in pairs if you would like to participate in that as part of your K-12 outreach. These are students who um, will, in the past, a large percentage of our students have ended up at Ivy League schools, but about 85 to 90 percent, as we've tracked them, go into some science or mathematics field. And what your work does with them is help them hit the ground running as freshmen and get involved in research right off the bat as freshmen because they've already been involved in it as high school students. Um, we do teacher professional development. And as a matter of fact, we also teach courses for um, graduate students and faculty on STEM teaching to um, make them better able when they go out and become faculty members to know more about what is uh, what does good STEM teaching look like, what should I be doing at the college level, and we've just started a faculty learning program that works uh, does the same thing for faculty. So that we have kind of a broad umbrella. I traditionally have helped a lot of faculty with the broader impact part of their grant. Sometimes they come to me and they don't have ideas at all of what they would like to do for broader impact. And sometimes they come and they have an idea and we, we kind of work it out um, together. I um, am happy to read the broader impact parts of, that you have written for your grant. Um, to make sure that you don't have like red flag words that anybody like me reading the grant would say, okay, clearly this person knows nothing about teaching and learning. Um, and there are a lot of those red flag words. It's just like when you, when you cross borders to a different discipline, you don't always know the, the jargon. Um, and uh, so I, I frequently will help people with that. I'll help you add references um, that you may need, some of you may need, especially those of you doing career grants. You have a much larger education section. It needs to be supported with literature references, and um, you'll need some sort of uh, much stronger assessment pieces in your grants than those of you who are just looking at broader impact for uh, like a regular NSF grant, for example. 
bet you're good at the assessment piece too. <laughs> That's kind of in a nutshell what the Office of STEM Teaching Activities does. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of what they do. Um, I thought it might be helpful to let people ask questions of maybe experiences, what they've seen, you know, ideas maybe that you have and what that might look like. Um, I don't want to put questions in your head, but does anybody want to start off with some kind of question? What would be an example of a red flag word? Uh, I'm going to train teachers. You train dogs, you don't train teachers. You're going to have professional development opportunities for teachers. So things like that. Anyone else? So what kind of activities or what kind of things could a person wanting to get an NSF career or just an NSF grant would wish to you know, participate in or think about the work that you guys are on? So for a career grant, you're probably going to want to have a ladder of experiences where you're doing something for K-12, something at the K-12 level, something at the undergraduate level, graduate, and maybe even postdoc. So you, you're going to probably want to talk about a whole ladder of experiences. Um, with K-12, the Mag Lab can connect you with some of their programs as well. We run several marine science programs. We run the Summer Young Scholars Program that I talked to you about. That's any discipline in science. Um, we have a, an outreach program that takes physical science materials um, that aren't available in regular school settings to classrooms to do physical science, K, K through 12. You might have ideas for activities that could be built into some of those programs. Same thing with the Mag Lab, I'm sure. Yeah, so, yeah that, would, <laughs> yeah, that would be more just like your regular NSF, you know, getting involved in some of those programs. A career grant, you're probably going to want to be de developing something special, um, maybe bringing K-12 teachers into your lab in the summer and then developing some something that they can take back to their class as a product. Um, and oftentimes I've helped uh, people think about their undergraduate teaching, transforming it into more active-based learning from a passive lecture, which we know is the way people learn least well. Um, and thinking about how can you integrate something from your research into a piece that fits into a course that you're teaching so that you really are integrating, you know, having broader impact with the research work that you're doing. Um, so those are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about career grant versus regular NSF program. And we have two kind of general pieces of advice we always give folks. One is that it should incorporate your research into whatever activity you're doing. So if it's not even remotely related to your research, it's not a great sell on any grant. And the other thing is if, if you have a passion for anything, if it's presentation style or if it's YouTube videos, you should tap into that. And if there's a group of, like age group tends to be the big thing. If there's an age group you know you don't want to work with, don't write it to your grant. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's really cute to like teach kindergartners stuff, but if you hate working with small children, or if it's not a skill set of yours, it's probably not a great group to tap. And we can kind of help you pinpoint which age group might be better, which would be more in line developmentally with what you're proposing. Um, so those are the two biggest pieces of advice we always give out: is tie it, make sure the tie to your research is strong. And make sure you're tapping into your own passions and your own pet projects. You may want to do something that's not K-12, but general public as well. And there are opportunities to think through some of those kinds of things. I know one, one that was in a grant proposal uh, a career, an awarded career, was it was this whole Ask a Scientist program. And so they go around to like First Friday and all these different venues and they set up a tent and they have Ask a Scientist. And NSF would love that idea. So, you know, you really can think outside of the box. It's really getting, communicating research to a broader, a broader audience. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to, to think beyond just the ones that people I'm do. just smiling because uh, there are now grant proposals 
on the education side to look at those kind of ask a scientist things and see do they do anything or not. Yeah. 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 That'd be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, other question. Um, so let's say I wanted to perform an activity in a classroom at a local school. What's the process for finding the teacher to, to work with? Either the mag lab or the, the OSTA, the Office of, Sci of STEM Teaching Activities, I've got to get used to the name change, um, can help you connect. We, both of us work across the board with teachers um, throughout Leon County, and um, I, I, don't, I don't know how broad the mag lab um, sweeps. It's probably as broad as us, but we work with a nine-county region for just our, our programs that are um, directing directed at students, with the exception of the Young Scholars Program, which brings students from all over the state. Um, so either one of us have uh, connections. If you want to do something that's more statewide, we, we have those connections as well, because for the Young Scholars Program, we send things out to every public and private high school, high school level now in the state. Um, so you can just contact either one of us, and we can help connect you with someone in the, in the school system. It may be now, um, this is just more practical information. Should you get your grant, you're probably going to need to get cleared with the school district yeah. to be in the schools. Um, so that'll be a, a bridge to cross later on. How long does the paperwork take? Clearance it doesn't take too long. Um, if you're going to get cleared with Leon County Schools, it, it'll cost you about $98 for the, because it's a full level two background mm -hmm. check. And the one that we do at FSU isn't good for Leon County Schools um, because none of the systems talk to each other, which is a piece that really should be addressed but hasn't been lately. Once you're cleared in Leon County Schools, we tend, uh, Leon County tends to be the most strict district, and if you're cleared in Leon County, oftentimes Wakulla or Gadsden or Jefferson will let you in to their schools based on your Leon County clearance. For those of you who aren't familiar with the counties outside of Leon County, there's a lot of underserved areas mm -hmm. um, that, you know, if, if you're wanting to go into an area that is underserved, you have access just minutes away of leaving Leon County. So think about that as, as you're thinking about yours. Um, Ellen, I had a question you had mentioned about assessing. Um, can you speak to, you know, you've read some of these? How, yeah. She was asking me about general assessment, and I'll let Carrie add in because she's she's more of an expert on this than I am. Um, but depending on what you're proposing, the way you're going to assess it may change. For some things, surveys are appropriate. For other things, you may want to have some kind of content assessment. Um, there's there's a broad range of assessments that you'll need. If you're writing a career grant, that's going to be a um, a much bigger part. They're going to expect to see some uh, assessment with real teeth in it. Um, for the broader impact, uh, it can be a lighter level assessment. Yeah, um, my advice is always to outline some really clear goals for your education programs first, and then your evaluation or your assessment should be driven by your goals, not the other way around. So I see a lot of folks who try to plan the test, for lack of a better phrase, first, and then tailor around it. You don't have to work like that. Um, develop your plans for what you actually want to do with students first, and then you can develop um, the appropriate metrics and how you're going to measure it. Um, there tend to be two major splits um, between assessment and evaluation. That, so one is if you're teaching content in a classroom, that needs to be assessment, and there's a whole set of jargon that comes along with that. If you're doing summer camps and you're trying to build things like um, excitement, interest in science, self-efficacy in science, that's your evaluation side, and there's a whole different set of jargon for that. So it's this very... Um, it's two different fields that overlap frequently, and so thinking through what it is you want to do first and what your goals are will help you better select the appropriate metrics. And I am always willing to help read through those proposals and kind of edit and provide suggestions as well. Um, but my, my advice is always plan your activities first and then let's do the evaluation second. Just to add a piece to that, 
there are a lot of assessments already um, developed and validated for reliability um, and um, that, you can, that we can connect you with if they're appropriate for your program. So especially on that side where she was talking about self-efficacy or interest in STEM, there are various ones that have already been developed and um, tested um, for um, uh, through a whole battery of what I call it psychometric evaluations, <laughs> yeah, um, to make sure that they're good assessments. And if you can use one of those, that's what you want to be using. And that way, you don't have to recreate the wheel. Yeah. And I, I have a whole folder of those <laughs> assessments and evaluations that have been tested and evaluated and validated. Some of you may be interested in things that are more mathematics oriented. I know I've had somebody from one of the science areas who really wanted to do something that was more of a mathematical outreach and what we did was connect you with somebody over in the math ed program. So we can also connect you with an appropriate person if it's not one of someone in our offices. Um, which program is what? I think either one of us can connect you with yeah, math yeah. ed or science ed. Math ed or science ed. Or higher ed, there's higher ed. But there are faculty members in the College of Ed who do their research in those areas. And so like if you wanted to write something that had a big math piece in there, that's not an area of expertise for me, but I would connect you with somebody from math ed who can help you out. Those are the folks who are preparing the future teachers and higher education professionals. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, I have a question about the budget for educational activities. So if we propose some summer camp, so what kind of cost would be, would be involved when we prepare the budget? Depends on what you're proposing to do, but both of our groups have experience helping you look at budget and think through how much would a teacher cost if I want to bring a teacher in my into my lab? Should I put a stipend in for the summer and how much is a reasonable stipend? We can all help. We can help you with those kinds okay. of things. I don't think there's a rule of thumb for how much percentage. Um, we always encourage make sure that folks what you're proposing, the budget you've attached to that is appropriate for what you're proposing. And we'll let you know. Okay, this is a really big thing you're proposing here, and so you're going to want to hire somebody to help <laughs> you with it because you won't have the time to do it. That kind of thing. Yeah, like planning a summer camp is a lot, a huge, <laughs> huge undertaking. Yeah. I don't know if there's any computer science people in here. Um, we're um, working, we have two things going now um, through our office. We have a computer science project that's working in middle schools that is an NSF supported um, educational research grant. Um, but also um, with the computational sciences area, we're getting ready to offer um, four or five coding camps this summer. So those are kinds of things that you all could get involved in as well. And we also offer two coding yeah, camps. Sure, yeah. You're going to give them our contact information, yes. right? I will provide their contact information to all of you. And this, this whole presentation is being recorded, so you can go back and share it with people. Um, I'm curious, when you're putting together this portion in a career proposal, is this pages and pages, or is this just a paragraph, or what is that? What have you seen? Um, in career proposals, I think the shortest section I've seen on their educational may be two and a half pages. Um, in a broader impact, maybe a couple of paragraphs. Um, I know that you're always trying to keep your education section so short because you have so much to say about your research sections. I, I, in writing grants, I know that that's such a hard trade-off, is what to say and what not to say. But um, for those of you who are interested in career grants, it needs to be a substantial um, write-up. Um, it's probably going to take you a couple of pages to describe it, to have the background support, the background literature support, um, and enough about what you want to do for assessment to be able to be successful. Follow-up question. So um, I know that these are due the end of July. Um, how soon would you expect to start working with people 
to, to kind of get this portion squared away? I'd probably speak for both of us. Summer is our busiest season mm -hmm. because that's when we're running a lot of camps and doing a lot of professional development with teachers. So the sooner you can get with us before summer starts, and that's um, that's the uh, K-12 summer, mm -hmm. so like the first of June, the better off we'll be. Um, so if you can get to us in May, probably, um, we're still doing yeah yeah we're still doing a lot of planning and gearing up for summer, but we're at least in the office. Um, but in the summer, we are just not in the office because we're out in schools with teachers with students. Yes. Uh, I have a question about, so if, if I would like to um, preferentially attract slash accept students from underrepresented groups or transfer students or something into research internships in my lab, is there a legal way to do that? Like how do I describe that in a way that doesn't sound like a no? <laughs> is, that, is that something that, that you all of our programs do that. Okay. We, we favor students who would not otherwise have access. Um, and the, we don't exclude anyone, but the recruitment and the marketing is heavily geared towards those groups. And that's something we always get asked about on our own education grants, especially to NSF, is like, okay, but how are you actually going to recruit those? Because the NSF cares. They, they want to see those students in these programs. So you are definitely well within normal practice to be heavily recruiting those students. And we can help you kind of work with the wording and that kind of stuff too. You're probably in your grant going to want to talk about underrepresented groups. Yes. Um, yep. And um, just where you recruit too can make a difference in that. <clears throat> So uh, you said you help us if we need to, how to phrase things, the correct wording, and so on and so forth. But I'm thinking that the people who are reviewing are people like us who do not do a lot of education. And Every review panel is going to have a person, an education expert on it. Okay, so we, they would know what we are talking about. It would not be like me yeah. asking my husband what does this term mean <laughs> every other um, line. Most of our group has served on NSF review panels. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Because my husband does active learning a lot, but it's a whole different field in terms of what the research is there. Mm -hmm. And although I would like to incorporate that into my proposal, but it's a big gap between what I understand and how things are progressing in active learning. So there's some free downloads you can make from the National Academies Press. If you're talking about active learning, you're usually talking undergraduate teaching, and um, you should get yourself a copy of Discipline-Based Educational Research. It's a National Research Council publication. It's a slim book, but it's also a free download, and you can read um, that right there in a fairly concise form what um, their review of where the research is for teaching and learning at uh, the undergraduate level. It's called discipline-based because at the undergraduate level we teach by discipline and so the research is done on biology teaching or physics teaching. <coughs> but if you go to National Academies Press website, there's a number of free downloads of, um, from the National Research Council. They're kind of compendiums of where research is sitting right now. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Have you ever um, seen people say they're going to do too much? Yes. Okay, what's, that look, what's that look like? I'm going to single-handedly plan a summer camp mm -hmm. with no budget. Mm -hmm. We've seen that. Um, that's the big one. Um, summer camps tend to be very popular mm -hmm. um, for the grants we see come through. And we spend, I want to say, like, our, our camp budgets are in the tens of thousands, um, not in the hundreds. And so we see that a lot, and we hire, even though we are our center, we still hire summer camp teachers to be the on-the-ground teacher for the camps. Um, so that's the biggest thing we see a lot of is... And the teachers know what they're doing with the kids. Yeah. They're trained in classroom management, mm -hmm. so they know how to handle any behavior problems that may come up, because they are kids. Um, and so that's, 
something that we don't necessarily have as folks who have been out of the classroom um, for a while. So when you write that, do you say, I will be partnering? Mm -hmm. So um, both of us <coughs> frequently write letters of support. Um, they used to be like letters with meat in them, telling them exactly what we would do. Now we're uh, restricted to Two, two or three lines that says, if you're funded, we'll do what you said you would, we'll help you in the way we, you said we would in your grant proposal. So you'll need to put the text in your proposal that you're partnering with one or the other or both groups um, uh, to offer whatever it is you happen to be offering. If I understand right, say you're going to work with Gadsden County, you would need that same letter from Gadsden County. From Gad if you're going to work with their, them as a school district, and they're quite... School or districts, any county, or yeah, school districts are quite used to that, and it'll be easier for you because you aren't really doing research, so you won't have to go through their research approval process. And then you're not testing the kid, right? You're providing something. You're not trying to get something out of them. Yeah, I just think that's important to mention, and I wanted them to say it because a lot of times people will wait till the last minute, and sometimes these letters, even though they're a couple sentences. They could take a while. So don't We're fast, that. but school districts are very slow at getting yeah. things back to you. And principals, a lot of times, you're, if you're working with a particular school in a school district, you can want a letter from the principal at that school. We don't want to see you panicking at the last minute that you don't have all of your letters in, you know, and it needs to go in. So that's why I would encourage you to think about this sooner rather than later and kind of get your ducks in a row so there's no surprises at the end where you can't reach somebody or something comes up. And we can help you make those requests too uh, because the research component is a big one. If they think you're trying to do research in the school, that is in a completely different process. It's very onerous. It takes a lot of time. So we can help you make the ask in a way that's clear. I just want to come do something fun with the kids to teach um, X, Y, and Z things. I'm not trying to research about learning. I'm not trying to research the students. My research is done in my lab. This is just something I'm doing to spread my research. So what, so folks in the College of Education can also apply for careers, right? And I was just thinking, so theirs would be different. Theirs is different, yeah. Theirs and they're already good. familiar with IRB. Yeah, and you have to do, anybody here who's in that, you have to do IRB here on campus and then and often almost all the time now, but there may be a couple that are a little bit behind the times, but often you have to go through an IRB in the individual school district as well. Our IRB does not count for both. We work with physicists who are always very surprised to hear that IRB is a thing. So you shouldn't assume that you don't have to go through IRB. If you're not collecting data on the kids, then you, you don't. If you're, if you're evaluating a project, then you don't. If you're collecting data for research purposes, then you do. Sorry, can you tell me a little more about IRB? Yes. Yeah. The Institutional Review Board, it's just like human subjects research oh. approval. That's what everybody's shorthand for human subjects research approval. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So as long as you're re researching things, you're good. It's when you step into researching people that you need this extra layer of review to make sure all ethics are being followed. And are there College of Medicine people in here? Because they have a whole other layer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then there's also animal subjects, right? And then yeah. there's I cook and all of that. Yeah. So. How complicated is that? You get into the animal subjects. How complicated is that? Bar. It's pretty complicated. I'm the daughter of an animal resource veterinarian, so I heard that all my whole life. Um, but you should start that early too. But you can you work with the, the animal people right here on campus. Okay. Yeah, it's better to ask. With any of this, it's better to ask questions early if you you don't have to engage for a couple months. Figure out what you need to know and when they need to have it, so you don't get surprised towards the end. That's and they can give you pricing too. Yeah. How much things are going to cost so you can get the right budget prepared. Other questions? Big question now. Is there any other things that you can think of as far as career goes? No, I'm happy. Like I said, one of the things that I do for arts and sciences is 
stand with a foot in both worlds, in the STEM world and in the education world. My PhD is in neuroscience, but I've been doing research and teaching and learning for about 20 years. So part of my job is just to liaise between the College of Education and the College of Arts and Sciences. So if you do need to be connected to somebody in the College of Education, um, you can see me and I can try and connect you with the right person over there. Um, and sometimes I, and they do the same thing, sometimes I send Pete, I'll tell you that the Mag Lab is going to be better set up for what you want to do and I may send you out to see them or vice versa. Because we came at it from the flip side where all of our degrees are in education and we try to keep a foot in the science research world. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, my question is not directly related to what you just said, but um, if one of my ideas is to, to have paid internships in my research lab to attract the lower income students, there, are they permitted to take a paid internship as a DIS? Are they undergraduate? Credit? Yeah. So the one thing you need to know about that, and I run into this with FSU Teach all the time, is yeah. when you pay students, yeah. it affects their financial aid. So oftentimes when we're trying to get scholarships in the hands of our FSU Teach students, we're giving them money and the financial aid is taking away the same amount of money. For summer internships? For, for any kind of work. So what you, what you need to do is you're going to also need to talk, in that situation, you're going to want to talk to the financial services people um, to find out what's the best way for you to approach this. If it is possible to do it as an add-on, it's, it's very tricky to do things as an add-on. Um, even when you're just like paying them as an OPS worker, that's adding money to their coffers. If, and it depends on the kind of money that they're getting, but oftentimes it will take money away from their finan financial aid packages. It's, that's a tricky one. It's a good question to ask. And we have also paid, rather than appointing them as OPS, we've paid using participant support, which is a different line of funding. Um, and this is getting outside my realm. A little bit but um, instead of being paid hourly and they take a paycheck every two weeks they get one giant chunk of money at the beginning and then another giant chunk at the end um, so we uh, our group could help answer questions about how that works um, and see if that may be a way to get around some of that yeah it doesn't but um, you, you won't have trouble with teachers because um, you can pay them and participant support costs work with teachers in if they write participant support costs into their grants, is that not subject to um, indirect cost? I don't know how it works for them. I you're right. I'm not positive. Yeah, I know on educational grants, when you have participant support costs, like I'll have $30,000 of participant support costs, that is not liable for indirect costs. So it lowers the amount of my money that is assessed at direct cost. So if you're going to have some kind of participant support cost, you'll have to work with sponsored research. Yeah. Sponsored um, research or your department will let me know that yeah. sponsored research will definitely know. That's a whole other can of worms that you have to be aware of. But I don't find generally that you all have a lot of participant support costs in your grants. Yeah, and some of our department tries not to let us do that. Probably That's why. Because there's no well, and then what they do when you get the grant, they split your grant into what looks like two grants here on campus so that they can track what they can charge in direct costs on separate from what they can't charge in direct costs on, and that makes everything more complex, too. I have no idea why we still use participant <laughs> support, but I know we do, so could answer questions if that ends up being a route you choose. I can hook you up with people who can answer the questions. It can be tricky. Yeah. And are you funding participant support? Yeah, so if you're going to add, but you, know, you can also add an REU onto your grant as yep. separate from your grant, and an RET as well, a, a teacher experience. That's what we've done. That could be an underrepresented group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you would pay their um, stipend and then housing and travel if, if needed, and they would go through, like since you're at the Mag Lab, they'd probably go through the Mag Labs program, so you wouldn't have to do things like worry about where they sleep at night or plan professional development for them. They participate with the rest of the group. It's just they're being paid off your budget instead of the Mag Labs RE budget. It's kind of a lot of work to do. I could get one working paid by Mag Lab in my house. <laughs> if you 
Our budget person is very good at catching grants who have promised Searle resources that have not allocated funds for it. So. So, so Ellen, you are funded by Arts and Sciences. You're at the back. Uh, mm -hmm. would, if people are not in these two areas, you'll still be able to mm -hmm. help out. Yeah, absolutely. I had somebody at College of Medicine in the other day. So. Okay. Just that I would ask. Yeah. yeah. Um, other questions? I, I just wondering, um, what, what, how, how long is the process uh, for the uh, IRB to approve the project? Mm -hmm. Well, they're changing it right now with all the new ramp things. Um, <coughs> so I don't, I can't answer that accurately right now because uh, for educational pieces, I think ramp may make things harder because they're they seem to be going more along with what has to be done for medicine. And with educational research, if you're doing something that they regularly do in the classroom, it's it's not like it's not as um, it's not considered uh, exempt. Yeah, it, it gets exempt. Currently, it gets faster faster review because it's the same kind of things kids do in education all the time. Um, so I can't really speak to how this new ramp uh, module is going to affect the speed of IRB for anything educational. But in the past, with exempt review, it's been a few weeks, um, like maybe three. Um, if you're doing anything with minors, you do not get to have exempt review. Mm -hmm. um, How about the data? So it uh, gets approved from the, uh, basically, how, how long is the process for the, for, for the IRB to prove that data, data set? So, so allow you to do some research with the data set? You doing secondary data analysis? Secondary. Right, right. Yeah, that I just did a, a proposal for secondary data analysis, and I will tell you that the writing of the proposal took longer than getting it approved. <laughs> so um, that I was able to turn around in a couple of weeks. Probably the fact that it was well written is had to do with how fast it got approved. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, it's probably still six weeks though because it was I want to say my first. It's secondary data analysis on national data sets, and it was still. Um, I think six weeks start to finish um, from writing the thing, and my actual proposal, I want to say, was about 18 pages. And most of it was just, the data's already been collected, next section. The data's already been collected, next section. So it's still, um, it's still a task to get that done, even with secondary data analysis on adults. If any of you aren't familiar with being out here, um, the Human Subjects Committee is in this next building. So if you have questions, <laughs> just you're here. If you want to pop by, this would be a good time to do it. They're I, right up right in building B. So I guess the bottom line there is with them switching to a different system, uh, ask early what, what's needed. And I mentioned that too with proposals because these proposals will all go through ramp because it starts July 1st. So Give yourself some time because it'll be new. I'm not saying it's going to be harder, but anything you're doing brand new, you know, can sometimes be a challenge. And there'll be a lot of people doing this. There'll be a lot of questions coming in. So just keep that in mind. Well, thank you both sure. for coming.